please hit subscribe. For those of you preparing for Mathematics A, I've also surveyed the past papers and come up with the following possible list of topics that will come out in the next exam. I also looked at the MEXT website in Japanese and I also looked at what they usually teach in high school under a subject called Mathematics A. So here's what I found out. The usual topics would be, as usual, there will be general mathematics. There's a lot of probability, geometry and analytic geometry, and trigonometry, and there's some calculus. Under general mathematics, I saw that there were a lot of questions about graphing. So what about if you graph a quadratic function, normally a parabola or a circle? What if you move it to the left? What if you move it to the right? What if you move it units up and down? Things like that. Then that means you, you will also have to, tr to learn to solve quadratic, quadratic equations using the quadratic formula and factoring because you will need that to be able to get the, the values that you need in the translation. And of course, under, fun under functions, there are questions about logarithms and exponentials. Some will ask you to solve an exponential equation or a logarithmic equation. Then those functions, so there is a special mention for parabola because the parabola is the tool of choice when looking for maximum and minimum of quadratic functions. So this is the standard form of the parabola. Here you have x minus h. h is the location where the minimum or the maximum happens. So if it's positive, you have a minimum because if it's positive, the parabola opens upward. If it's if this is negative, the parabola opens downward. So you have a maximum and that value, the minimum of the maximum, the minimum or the maximum is given by K here. Then there were many, many questions about sequences, arithmetic sequences, geometric sequences. What if you sum the terms in the sequences? We call those series. Some of terms of sequences are called series. And of course, it will be convenient if you if you try to remember the binomial theorem, how to use it. It's it, it tells you the coefficients when you expand a binomial x plus y and you raise it to n. The binomial theorem will tell you the coefficients. And this can be useful when you are doing series because um, there are some tricks that you can use when when adding the terms of a sequence using the binomial theorem then if we're talking about sequences and series the mathematical induction mathematical induction is actually a good tool to remember they might give you i haven't seen this in the previous papers but i can imagine they might give you a sort of a paragraph where they will walk you through a mathematical induction proof about a series or a sequence but that's just speculation on my part this but it's good to to understand mathematical induction it's probably going to help you with the series and the and the sequences then there's a bit of set theory that will be involved it's not very hardcore set theory so probably you'll have to learn about unions and intersections and that's going to help you in the probability probability topics Speaking of probability, there are three things that you might want to review first is the counting techniques, then the idea of conditional probability, and of course, the common tools that they use when they give problems on probability. So these common tools would be dice, deck of cards. So you have 52 in a deck of cards. So you just might want to get yourself familiar about the cards so that you can understand the problem easily when they come up and also coins. So these are the common things that are used in probability questions. And also, uh, it's very important to learn the counting techniques because this is what you use to know the, num the numerator and the denominator in your probability expression. So there are two types of things that you can count. It's called permutations and combinations. Permutations is the number of arrangements. So if you have three items, A, B, and C, a, B, C is different from B, A, C, which is also different from C, A, B. And there are, in fact, six different permutations if you have three items and then you, you permute all of them. 
and the way you compute that is n factorial if you have if two of those items two out of three actually are the same let's say you have a a b then instead of n factorial you have to divide n factorial by k factorial where k is the number of items that are repeating and also combinations are very common so the difference the difference of combinations from permutations is that combinations do not care about the arrangement of the items so if you're given a b c it's the same as b c a it's the same as c a b so there's only one combination if you are given three items and you want a combination of three items so three taken three at a time you get just one combination but if you are given for example three items and they say yeah okay just take one at a time one item from the three at a time so of course that's a different number of combinations in fact you know that you can take a you can take b or you can take c so those those are three different combinations and the way you compute that is this formula here where r is the number of items you take at a time so it's that you put them in a bag and you only put r items in the bag so one bag is one combination then the idea of conditional probability might come up in the exam it's not very common but it's good to know so the idea here is that if you have if you have this um if the question asks for the probability for something to happen when you already know that something else happened so the thing that you know is b and you're asking for what is the probability that a happens if you know that b already happened so what we have here the expression for this is that you, you get the probability of b to happen and on top is the probability of a and b happening simultaneously it's happening together and these are the common topics in probability for geometry they they have questions about triangles and circles and polygons here i just mentioned that for triangles for example it will be useful to remember the triangle inequality this means that a triangle is only possible if you have if you have once if, if one of the sides is less than the remaining two so any side of a triangle must be less than the sum of the other two sides then you also have Sivas theorem and Menelaus theorem so it's a little bit more complicated to explain but you can look this up on the internet and they're actually there these will help you with some of the more complex geometric problems then it's also a must to remember the special angles the questions will often ask you about about angles and they will they will not give you values for the sine of 30 for example so you have to remember these values because it's not going to be given in the problem then there's also trigonometry so normally that would cover the identities of sines and cosines the sum and difference identities the pythagorean identities which which is based on sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one then the double angle and the half angle identities are also there so the, these will help you compute angles that are related to special angles so for example you already know that the that the special angle 30 degrees has a sine of one half now they might you might need to compute the sine of 15 degrees so the way you do that is you use the half angle identities and then there's also the sine law which tells you the relationships between the among the sides a b c of a triangle whose angles are capital a capital b and capital c so if you have any triangle this holds as long as the way you label it is such that the angle let's say the capital a angle is opposite the side a and the same for b and c so if you label your your angles and and sides that way then the sine law holds for any triangle if you label your triangle in that way the cosine law also holds it says that if you have if you have the sides these sides c a and b then the angle opposite 
the side C can be put here, cosine C, and this relationship actually holds. You usually use the cosine law if you are given three sides or if you are given two sides and an included angle, meaning the angle between the two sides. You can use this to solve the remaining parts of the triangle. Then there's a bit of calculus in the papers. They come in the form of derivatives, dy, dx, and integrals. For derivatives, there were questions about minimum and maximum, so it's good to review that. For integrals, I saw a question or a problem about volumes, and maybe there will be some questions about areas. And for the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's, it's convenient to remember this because this will make some this will make the answering of some questions a bit easier and there are just two parts the second part is quite familiar if you need to find the integral of a function then you just need to get its antiderivative that is the capital f here and you just plug in the upper limit here minus the lower limit so that will give you the area under f of x from a to b so this is quite f common and also the first one, some people forget this, but it is known that if you get the derivative of an integral, you will get the function inside it. As long as the derivative here is taken with respect to the upper limit or the lower limit, wherever the variable may be. So here we have the variable on the upper limit. So if you do dx, d, d dx of this whole integral, you get this. So those are the topics that I think will be in the Mathematics A questionnaire. Again, I just based them on the past papers, what I saw in the past papers, and on the next website. So I hope you do well in your preparation, and good luck in your exam. If you learned something new today, please help my channel by clicking the subscribe button and the bell for the notifications. See ya!